We have a lot to say about saying things, right? <laughs> this is the sila of speech. Some years ago, we sat a retreat with Bhante Gudaratna, who authored the book, Mindfulness in Plain English. And a shout out to all of you. Uh, some of you have asked specifically about references. That is a good reference, Mindfulness in Plain English. Bhante, which means teacher, also developed what's called the eight lifetime precepts. Precepts are guidelines for non-harm in everyday life. They aren't commandments. They're guideposts that help us steer our speech and our action toward less harm and more skillfulness. These eight lifetime precepts are an expansion of those precepts put forth by the Buddha. Perhaps Bhante felt that the traditional one line devoted to speech needed elaboration. Some of you may be familiar with the five precepts lay practitioners sometimes chant in Pali or speak in words when they go on retreat. The line goes like this. Musawada we ramani sikapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from incorrect speech. Right. What does that mean? What does that mean, incorrect speech? Can we get a little bit more granular, a little bit more precise about what it is we're looking at? Well, Bhante broke it down for us using the Buddhist teachings. This being sila practice, it can be delivered or divided into speech and action. And Bhante teased out the, the various threads of unskillful speech, false speech, which is lying, malicious speech, which is the intentional wishing of harm, harsh speech and useless speech. False, malicious, harmful, and useful. Which is it? You need to know what, what you're looking at so you can discern how to relate to it. What each one looks like, feels like. How do they need to be treated or related to? Is it best to refrain, restrain, contain, to kindly hold, to care for, to kindly consider? before, during, after. The delineation of unskillful or harmful speech into these four categories, false, malicious, harsh, useless, have been really helpful for me in trying to hone this ubiquitous skill because it is indeed ubiquitous. Talking is so second nature that we tend to not consider it, to not notice how or why we speak or the impact inside or out on ourselves, on each other, on the collective stew that we swim in. Words fly. Is it a reaction? Was there an unmet need? Am I angry, sad, mad, glad, anxious, scared, grieving, depressed, lonely, bored? What's driving me to speak or not? We spend the bulk of our days either speaking or listening to ourselves or others. How do you talk to yourself in the privacy of your mind? And I have to say, I was so struck the first time I had ever heard Mariah Fenton Gladys's simple question, which Bill said yesterday. If you whispered in my ear all the things you said to yourself today, would I have a good day? Well, I'd like to share a little bit of, of my world with you, <laughs> where it's been and sort of where it is. I was raised Catholic raised with a lot of fear of going to hell and, um, and feeling fundamentally and fatally flawed as a sinner. Twice I was told by a priest that I would go to hell if I didn't change my ways. This not enough truly was in the air that I breathed. All of that is backstory, which is to say that my mind, like your mind, has a lot of negative things floating around in the atmosphere. Just from what you've heard. And to have this not enough loom in the background, oops, hold on, let me make sure people are muted here. Apologies. And to have this not enough loom in the background from the starting point is indeed a burden, a cross to bear, a kind of atmospheric purgatory. But this drone of a tone that held me under its thumb was hard to see, very hard to see. 
I'd lived with those negative tapes for so long that I couldn't see them or hear, or hear them. And if I did, they serenaded me as if they were normal and familiar because they were. And even though I'm a psychotherapist, even though I've spent years doing my own therapy, and I feel relatively kind, happy, sane, when I sat down on the cushion, I was greeted with an untamed mind that had a lot to say and a lot of negative things to say to me, to you, to nobody, to everybody, to the universe. When I began practicing mindfulness, that's when I really started to see how I was treating myself and the privacy of my mind. And holy smokes, it wasn't pretty. I was unkind, harsh, punitive, critical, with plenty of shoulds and not enoughs and perfectionism. It was crazy. It was painful. It didn't make logical sense at all. As I just said, I'm pretty kind, happy, relatively sane human being. And also I've, I've been fortunate enough to have good enough parents and good enough elders around me. So how is it that I learned to speak so unkindly? We humans take in and absorb a lot of, from our environment and we adapt and habituate to them very quickly so quickly that it's easy to start to miss the signs, the slow slide off the rails to see what is right in front of you. We tend to miss the obvious until we trip over it. You might begin to notice the effect, for example, that reading, watching, or listening to the news has on the warp and woof of the mind chatter. Are you grumbling more about X, Y, and Z? What are you absorbing, really? Sometimes my deepest practice is off the cushion. Sometimes my deepest practice is taking my stand. Please get Kwan Yin. Get Kwan Yin for me. Taking my stand with kind eyes, as if Kwan Yin, the goddess of compassion, or my mother's hands were tending to the wounds on my face. I have to be deliberate. I used to so easily slip into a trance of unworthiness when I stood, when I stood in front of that mirror that somehow, and some of you know this, I, I needed reinforcements. I knew I needed reinforcements. So I brought this, this, this 15 inch Quan Yen. <laughs> it's, it's up, forget it, Bill, it's up there. Quan Yen with me. And it actually, she travels with me where I go. I'm trying to get Bill to fetch it for me right now so you can see it. <laughs> Seriously, like, she is really my companion and she so helps me remember when I'm having a hard time being kind, I just look at her and that's how I remember to be kind. See, mindfulness practice is about that. It's about remembering to remember, to bring mindfulness to mind, to inhabit a view that is kind and that's accepting of what is. It asks us to notice what's going on right now, to meet ourselves right where we are and to set a practice there. And out of this sitting in stillness and quiet, all manner of creatures will come out from the corners of your mind. Here's the encouragement. Come to practice as if mindfulness is the host, is hosting for say the next half hour, whoever or whatever comes to visit inside this guest house, this, guest house, this body. Rumi's guest house was this whole body. This is also Buddha's laboratory, the one he recommended we use. This sets up the stage that will help us to be to support us when we are working with unkind voices. So in the beginning, it was really hard for me to notice and tolerate the many and varied unkind voices that would appear. I practiced. Noticing for a long time with baby steps into the pool of feeling the ouch. <laughs> because that's actually where it's transformative is feeling the ouch, but we need to, to take our time with that. First order of business is to notice. With practice, I began to notice and get a feel for lying, for example, for fudging the truth when I wasn't quite, quite speaking the honest truth. Um, and I would notice that when I was doing that for good reasons, you know, for what I thought was a wholesome intention and what was not so wholesome. Practice helped me to notice and feel for malicious, the maliciousness of backbiting or of just talking about someone who isn't pres present in a slightly unkind way. Practice has helped me to notice and get a feel for when the harsh voice of scolding or chastising or bullying appears on the scene. And 
mindfulness has helped to me to notice and feel when I'm dreamy, disconnected, distracted with idle chatter that's filling the airwaves. Notice, no judgment, just notice. And then notice the many and varied voices that serenade you throughout the day as if Muzak piped into the stores to encourage shoppers to stay and buy your Muzak, you know, the catchy tunes, the familiar lyrics that are whispering, you're stupid, defective, ugly, what a jerk, how clumsy, awkward, too much, not enough. Every which way but sideways, you're not enough. Get it, see it, see this. These slings and arrows of harm. See yourself bumping along to the rhythm of them because they're familiar. That's what the mind does. And we're waking up to that. That's the point of the practice, to wake up to these shenanigans. <laughs> this is what mindfulness helps us to do, is actually to see, see what's going on and to learn how to unhook from them. So welcome to the wilderness of your mind. Let's put out on our explorer hat and let's see what kind of mind we've got today. Before we can make you know, any changes, we have to see what's going on in here. So let's, let's have an adventure. Let's practice keeping an eye out for the rough voices. This is the scout feature of mindfulness. Let's see what's there and see what we can settle down. 